we're just a recent uh, blip on, on life on planet Earth. But look what we've done. Well, I think everybody pretty much knows that when you commission a new ship, civilian or military, the first thing you do is smash a bottle of champagne across the bow. The theory being that you want the very first thing that that first liquid that that bow to touch is champagne, and it's kind of downhill all the way after that. There's a similar tradition uh, in um, astronomy. We don't smash champagne bottles against uh, telescope mirrors or lenses, but there is something called first light, which I've always thought was a tremendously romantic idea and, and a very beautiful idea. First light for a telescope is Telescopes are complex, big ones anyway, complex, uh, expensive, delicate objects, take a lot of time to build, a lot of time to put together. And first light is when the telescope has been completely attuned and everything's in place and you start to get your first images. Well, we've just today, uh, as we record this, received uh, first light images from the James Webb Space Telescope. It's well over a decade later than it should be, well over budget. It's an astonishingly audacious idea and it is about as revolutionary as the Hubble Space Telescope was 20, 25, 30 years ago now. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Little here with Steve Green and Scott Ott, and uh, this is your right angle on a new eye into the uh, universe. And when I say a new eye, it's not just a better telescope. It's a completely different kind of telescope. Uh, Steve, I've got here... Uh, two pictures that you can see on the screen. Uh, one of them on the left is the very famous Pillars of Creation, uh, the Hubble telescope uh, took decades ago, and astonishingly increased our ability to see what's going on in the universe. And then if you look at the exact same uh, photograph taken on the right by just released by the uh, James Webb telescope, you can see what appear to be billions and billions of stars that are not in the other image. And they're not in the other image not because the Hubble was defective. They're not in the other image because the James Webb telescope is looking at infrared and most all, 90%, I wanna say, of the stars in our galaxy are red dwarf stars. Hmm. They're too faint to see in the visible spectrum, but once you get into the infrared, the whole universe just lights up in this unbelievably dramatic fashion. Yeah. Uh, Steve, I gotta tell you, when. I was always excited about the next generation space telescope after the astonishing uh, triumph of Hubble. But when I heard that it was a, an infrared telescope, I thought, oh, an infrared, that's not going to be much to look <laughs> yeah. at, you know, yeah. kind of. In no, 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 no. No, this is astonishing. It, breathtaking. I know I used that word last week when I was talking about trees, and now I got to say it again about the highest tech thing that maybe humanity has ever built. It is astounding. It's amazing. I want to sing NASA's praises because we've been picking on NASA a lot these last few mm -hmm. years with the SLS. This is what but NASA should be doing. It is. And, you know, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here. You know, we've had this discussion several times over the years about how cost plus accounting has just ruined the the, the Pentagon's budget. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's responsible for the space launch system, severe overruns. But Sometimes cost plus accounting is what you've got to do. When the government needs to buy something, and it's typically government that has to do this, that is so revolutionary, so radical that nobody's attempted anything like it before, there's no way for a private firm to really estimate the costs. Um, Webb was originally budgeted, at, I think, 500 million or so, and it came in at 10 billion. So they were only off by 20 to 1. That's, that's, that's a big hole in the budget. But literally everything about Webb was either revolutionary, extraordinarily complex, or had never been done in space before, or all three. I mean, just, just the unfolding mechanism for yeah, these- incredible. For the mirrors, which you couldn't properly even test because they unfold in space and we're at 1G here. And it this thing is so complex that we they, they didn't even know the procedures they had to invent just to sort of maybe make sure this thing was gonna work. And it's worked flawlessly. Um, the French, who we also like to make fun of, uh, they nailed the launch with the Ariane rocket. Um, they, they got so close. Uh, just almost pinpoint accuracy to the to the launch box. You want to get it as close to the center of the, the box as you can. Um, that we're going to get, I think, an extra decade of use out of Webb because it had to use that much less of its limited maneuvering fuel to get into that. I did not know that, that perfect position. Yeah. That's so cool. the the 
the the French just absolutely nailed it. And what's really exciting is um, we have no way to service this thing. It's a million miles out. If something <laughs> breaks or uh, or maybe we just, hey, look, we could nothing's wearing out as quickly as we thought. What if we could get some more fuel on that thing? We can't do any of this yet. Mm. Starship yeah. is coming along. Elon Musk had a bad day. I think it was uh, Monday. There was a, a Starship test that did not go well. Um, and one thing I love about uh, Musk, even though I disagree with him and I'll probably never own a Tesla, I don't, don't care for those, is his openness. Uh, he went on Twitter to say, bad news. <laughs> this is this not good. good. Yeah, bad day. Yeah, this is not good. Uh, so big respect for that. But there is going to come a time if Starship pans out, and I think it will, that we're going to be able to service that telescope or – Thanks to uh, Starship's tremendously improved payload, not just in terms of mass, but in terms of diameter, there were compromises that had to be made for Webb because it had yep. to fit on top of a skinny little Ariane rocket. I'm thinking about what we could put on Starship mm. and the pictures it can take. Webb is going to be able to see, I believe I remember this correctly, um, so far back in time, Bill, it's not just the red dwarves. It's the the older light is, the further back in time you go, the, the fainter it shifts. is. The fainter it is. Um, Webb is so sensitive, it's going to be able to take pictures dating back to just 300 million years after the Big Bang. That's a revolutionary improvement over how far back uh, Hubble can see. And um, it's turning us all into time travelers, into the 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 – basically the opening moments of the universe. It's one of my favorite things I used to talk about when I was teaching astronomy is that when you look up at the night sky, you're, you're essentially moving through time. That all of the light that you see is coming from different places at different times. Some of the lights traveled, well, in the case of Alpha Centauri, it's traveled four and a half years to get here. In other cases, it's 30 years, 50 years, 100 years. In the case of the Andromeda Galaxy, which is the farthest thing visible to the naked eye, it's two and a half million years of uh, zipping around the earth seven times a second to get to us. Uh, Scott, they finally did something that I've been just so, I've always felt was so important. Uh, and on the release of these images, they, they finally did what I thought was a, a really great job of trying to, of trying to explain to people the scale, not yeah. the scale of how big the universe is. That's inconceivable. When I talk about scale, I'm talking about how much stuff is in a tiny little area. Here's an image from the uh, James Webb uh, Telescope. And you can see that virtually everything in this is a galaxy. Those little crescent-shaped things, by the way, they're, they're not misshapen galaxies. That's gravitational lensing. That's Albert Einstein saying, told you. <laughs> but this image, which contains scores, hundreds of galaxies, and, and each one with two, 200 billion stars each, this picture represents an area of the sky equivalent to a grain of sand held at arm's length. Yeah. A grain of sand held at arm's length, that speck contains this much creation in it. And by golly, that's just what you just sit there and just what do you say? It just other than wow. Or or like the guy used to say on television, I'm blotting you out. I'm blotting you out, galaxies. I'm crushing, I'm crushing, I'm crushing you, galaxies. galaxies. I'm galaxies. crushing you. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's funny because when I saw the picture, uh, I remembered the scripture that says, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And it is that sense of awe of the magnificence of the size and scope of the universe and the beauty of it, frankly, the, just the, just the just unbelievable, the breath-stopping, gorgeous beauty of it all. And, uh, you know, as, as a believer to go, wow, he did that. He cares about this. <laughs> I mean, that's phenomenal. If I could do that, I wouldn't care at all about you two. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd be out there like just going, hey, let's do more of this. Who cares about those bums back on that one little dust speck back there? But that that just really stirred my soul. And it's just amazing. I love when uh, when we try to push the envelope and push the boundaries and go further. Um, I saw a story recently, by the way, 
that somebody has an idea that people who are concerned that uh, and, and, and actually this is not a bad thing even if you're not embracing the global warming theory they have this crazy theory that maybe it's the sun that makes the world hot <laughs> and so they're saying hey what if we position they, what they described as bubbles which I kind of describe as parasols um, way way out in space <laughs> at the point where it would be far enough so that you could uh, basically screen out uh, part of the sun's rays coming to the shade, earth shade shade the planet yeah a shade bit. the planet yeah. exactly and you know it wouldn't be perceptible from earth except that there would be some micro degrees of temperature difference and you know reduce that but you know some people look at that oh that's a crazy nonsense and i'm like I want people thinking about stuff like that. I think yeah. it's awesome that they're going, hey, I bet we could get a better picture of the Grand Canyon if I just went out to the edge of the canyon and then took four more steps. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's essentially what this web telescope is. It's like, let's go all the way to the edge of the canyon and then let's take four more steps. Like how far away can we get from the planet so that we can still get the images and somehow get them back to the planet so that we can see them. And all of the thinking that had to go through, like, you know, as Steve was talking about, a lot of this stuff couldn't even be tested on earth, you know, but it was, it was math. <laughs> It was engineering. It was people who devoted years of study with a passionate desire to make a difference and, and to run calculations over and over and over again and to try to figure out why that why one little comma was screwing up everything. I mean, that those people uh, deserve our praise. And frankly, as much as those people who just watched their rocket blow up on the pad um, in Boca Chica uh, you know, the other day, um, those people are on that journey to make a difference, to make an impact, to refuel the Hubble, I'm sorry, not the Hubble, but the Webb um, Space Telescope, to be able to uh, build a planetarium, uh, an observatory on the surface of Mars. Um, all of this stuff is happening now a lot faster than it seemed to be just a few years ago. And even geezers like me are beginning to believe that we will see things like man walking on the surface of Mars and and wonders beyond current imaginings. Just a couple of quick technical things first. Uh, you can see from this picture, I'd love to credit it. I just don't know where it came from. I just saw it on the web. But you can see that both the Hubble and the uh, James Webb Telescope are very, very, very large uh, structures. But look at the size of the mirror. Hmm. The James Webb Telescope is two and a half, three times the size of the mirror on the Hubble. And it all comes down to aperture, folks. In astronomy, it's all about aperture. How much light can you collect? When you're trying to buy a telescope or somebody's trying to sell you a telescope, they'll say, oh, this thing has 200 power or 300 power. Power is ridiculous. I can, using lenses, I can get a million power out of a telescope this big. I won't see anything, yeah. but you can do it, right? It's all about how much light can you gather. So that big mirror is a big deal. And the other thing that Steve had mentioned too is that the Hubble Space Telescope is four times further away than the moon. And it is, there, it uh, is interesting beca because it's not a probe. It's, it's not, it hasn't left us. It's, it's still in orbit around the earth, essentially, well, around the sun anyway. And it's in a very unique, gravitationally stable thing, but it's it's it stays there. It's a million miles away, literally one million miles away. I just want to close by by saying this: people look at images like this and they see all of this unbelievable concentration of these massive, enormously huge spirals of stars, and and realize this is what's in one grain of sand held up to the sky, and then all of the other grains of sand, all of them, all have these kind of wonders. And it makes them feel very insignificant, mm. makes them feel very small, like we're lost in the stars or a speck of dust. You know, what are we? We're nothing compared to these things. I don't, I don't know how anybody can have that viewpoint, you know, to be able to do this, yeah. to be able to do this for, you know, for a bunch of primates that not too long ago, well before most of this light that we're looking at now left uh, the well before uh, these these things were sending light. We're, we're just a recent uh, blip on, on life on planet Earth. But look what we've done. We're looking, we are looking out so far into the universe and what we accomplish is so miraculous. Every single movie that's out there, everything we hear now is anti-human. We're a curse and we're a curse on nature. We're a cancer on the planet. No, we're not. No, we're not. This drive 
is is what makes us what we are. And it is, in my opinion, way, way more in terms of a counterweight to all of the bad things that we that we're capable of doing. No other animal does this. No other animal wants to do this. No other animal can do this. We continue to search further and further and come up with more and more ingenious ways to do it. And if that means we have to have five thin sheets of mylar one million miles away so that this mirror can stay very close to absolute zero, then by God, let's figure out a way to do that. And let's fly that thing and get it out there. We should all be proud of this. This is something to make Americans proud. I'm, I'm glad Steve pointed out the, the, the French for the launch. We're very grateful for that. Yeah. And these images belong to them. But the truth of it is, the images belong to everybody. Yeah. They're, they're, they belong to all of us now. And they're never going to go away. It's just the universe got bigger and sharper. And that's something we should all be uh, proud of. And in fact, should fill us with wonder. For Steve Green and Scott Ott, I'm Bill Whittle. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time here on Writing.